the feudal lords of Japan, daimyo, were first and foremost warriors. The primary obligation of their lives was maintaining constant readiness to do battle on behalf of their overlord, the shogun. The sword, accordingly, was the principal tool of the daimyo's metier and symbol of the values by which he lived. The Japanese longsword is both a lethal weapon and a work of art. Inscribed with the name of the swordsmith who forged it, and with its own name and provenance, a longsword like this one, a national treasure, was passed down through warrior families for generations, accumulating its own legend over time and a distinct personality known and feared by enemies who had to test themselves against its edge. Like the samurai warriors who owed him fealty, the daimyo was trained from childhood in the arts of war. In fact, the process of becoming a skilled swordsman constituted a major part of his physical, intellectual, and spiritual training. In 1336, the warrior leader Takauji Ashikaga from eastern Japan occupied the western capital of Kyoto. Takauji banished the emperor, installed a surrogate on the throne, and declared himself shogun. With the Ashikaga shogunate now in Kyoto, the warrior class was exposed to the influence of courtly elegance. By the mid-14th century, the daimyo was aspiring to more than skill at battle. As a result of his contact with nobles from the imperial court and Zen monks steeped in Chinese culture, he was also committed to becoming a man of cultivated taste. This obliged him to develop not only his warrior skills, but a genuine appreciation for the peaceful arts. Landscape gardening and architecture, poetry, painting, and calligraphy. The tea ceremony. The no theater. The warrior had in fact become a warrior esthete a man who sought to embody as the ultimate goal of his warriorhood both fierceness and sensitivity. This paradoxical ideal became known as the dual way of the sword and the writing brush. The tension created between its poles of force and delicacy is the animating energy of daimyo culture. Mr. Isaburo Nakamura is a kendo master of the eighth level. <laughs> その Calligraphy was one of the disciplines the daimyo practiced as part of his training in the dual way. In China, as well as Japan, the art of calligraphy was esteemed along with poetry and painting as one of the three excellences. A man's calligraphy was seen as a reflection of his inner self, his power, integrity, and ethical correctness. Mr. Shinzan Kamijo, 81, is an eminent calligrapher with a bold and forceful style which recalls the medieval period.
Mr. Kamijo completes the scroll and makes it a valuable work of art by adding his signature, Shinzan. The first Chinese character means contain. The second, radiance. This two-character compound, Gang Ko, was the name of a mythological sword from the Shang dynasty in ancient China. It also came to mean the internal radiance which suffuses all superior action, whether in art or public behavior. Mr. Morisada Hosokawa, author, cultural historian, and director of the Eisei Bunko Foundation and Museum, is descended from an illustrious daimyo family which reaches back to the 13th century. His great-great-grandfather was the last Hosokawa daimyo. Mr. Hosokawa was raised on stories about his warrior ancestors. それで、その、お前も矢をいらんかと。その、the life of Sansai Hosokawa, born in 1563, was a paradigm of the dual way. Sansai first went to battle at the age of 15 and earned the favor of the overlord Nobunaga. A formidable warrior in the battlefield for 20 of the most turbulent years in Japanese history, Sansai also served and fought under Hideyoshi, one of the unifiers of feudal Japan. At the same time, he was a noted scholar and natural scientist, a designer of armor, and an intimate disciple of Japan's greatest master of the tea ceremony, Rikyu Sen. For his valor in the Battle of Sekigahara in 1600, where he fought on the side of the victorious Tokugawa, Sansai was granted a family domain and castle in Kokura, and later moved to today's city of Kumamoto on the southern island of Kyushu. It was here, as Lord of the Hosokawa Domain, that he established his own school of tea to maintain the tradition of the ceremony as it had been reshaped by his master, Rikyu. This is the tea garden in Kumamoto, which Sansai designed for his own use. Tea was brought to Japan originally from Tang Dynasty China by Buddhist monks. Over time, the preparation and serving of the tea evolved into a Zen discipline for focusing awareness. In the 14th century, Zen monks introduced tea to the imperial court and the warrior class. The Zen residents remained strong, but in the hands of the daimyo warrior, the tea ceremony became more an aesthetic experience than a monastic discipline. At the stone water basin in front of the tea house, symbolically, with every motion prescribed, the invited guest washes away the dust of the material world and enters the purified domain of the tea ceremony. In Sansai's day, the guest might well have been a daimyo from a neighboring domain. The host was at pains to prepare for his guest a pleasurable experience. The guest's role was to be fully aware of the beauty and appropriateness of every detail presented. The scroll hanging in the alcove just inside the entrance will be a poem chosen by the host because it fits the season and this particular occasion. The flower arrangement and the flower holder are also observed and appreciated. The 
どういうものが関心があるんだということを調べてるわけですねそれでそのお客さんが来るとその人に合わせるように全部こっちが仕組みを立てるわけですだからその太閤秀吉がそのお前のところは大変そのあの朝顔が綺麗だそうだとそれを聞いて太閤は突然訪ねるんですねそうするとその太閤が来るということで利休さんは全部朝顔の葉のちょん切っちゃう捨てちゃうんですそしてねお茶室に太閤が入っていた時にただ一輪だけをねその花を生けてあったそれでその,その一輪の花が朝顔の全てを代表して全ての美しさがそこに集中しているわけですよねそれを太閤さんは見て非常に感心したわけだ。The full significance of the tea ceremony practiced by daimyo warriors like Sansai Hosokawa is best appreciated in the context of a country torn by civil war. Just outside the cramped space of the tea house, the reality of the 16th century was the chaos and terror of battle and the hovering presence of death. The tea ceremony, with its demands on the daimyo's total concentration, Functioned to isolate him from that overwhelming reality so that he could prepare himself to meet it. The tea bowl is warmed with boiling water and carefully dried before the thick, powdered tea called matcha is prepared. This 16th century bowl is a priceless masterpiece, Black Raku by the founding Raku potter Chojiro. The rest of the utensils used will have been selected to enhance the special beauty of this centerpiece. The harmony of all details is of key importance. The tea jar is a 17th century piece of seto ware by the potter Toshiro. The bamboo teaspoon was fashioned by the 8th generation Hosokawa daimyo Shigekata. In the preciseness of every designated move, one feels the presence of Zen discipline. The exact position on the tatami mat of each of the utensils is also designated. Nothing is accidental, including the sounds of the ceremony. Before the host offers the tea, he turns the most beautiful surface of the bowl outward toward the guest. The states of mind prescribed by Rikyu as the goal of tea ceremony were harmony, respect, purity, and stillness. Difficult states to attain in a frenzied world, but a sublime preparation for battle. The 16th century is filled with stories of daimyo generals who took their tea utensils with them to the battlefield.
Midway through the 16th century, tea had evolved into an excuse for the ostentatious display of valuable tea utensils. Hideyoshi, a lover of tea and Rikyu's patron, hosted lavish tea parties for both daimyo and court nobles and built a tea room covered in gold leaf. Rikyu both chastened the ceremony and enriched it with a new dimension. The appreciation of utensils was retained, but Rikyu asserted that any simple tea bowl was appropriate if handled in the proper spirit. In Rikyu's hands, tea became the occasion for two warriors to share the poignant realization that life was a fleeting moment. In fact, host and guest were to observe and savor every detail of the ceremony as if this were to be their final meeting in this life. As if the very violence of the times created in the warrior a need for beauty and refinement, the No Theater evolved during the same unstable period of history that produced the tea ceremony. In this gorgeous yet highly abstract theater, the merging of courtly elegance and the warrior sensibility at the heart of the dual way is plain to see. One of the earliest patrons of the No Theater was the third Ashikaga Shogun, Yoshimitsu. In 1397, Yoshimitsu built for himself to the northwest of Kyoto, a retirement villa called Kitayama, which included the Golden Pavilion. Retreating here from the chaos of the times, he drew around himself a coterie of poets, painters, tea masters, and Zen monks. Performances of no plays were frequently included in the evenings he hosted here. Mr. Otoshige Sakai belongs to the no school directly descended from the troupe patronized by Yoshimitsu. His three sons are already in training to carry on the family tradition. Mr. Sakai had his debut on the no stage at the age of three and performed his first leading role at age eight. In acknowledgement of his consummate skill as a performer, Mr. Sakai has been designated a bearer of important intangible cultural assets, the Japanese equivalent of cultural knighthood. Mr. Sakai will perform the climactic dance from Funa Benke, Benke at Sea. He plays the anguished spirit of a vanquished warrior. The demon rises from beneath the waves to avenge himself and his clansmen by destroying his conqueror in life, the warrior Yoshitsune. To convey the purity and innocence for which he stands, the role of Yoshitsune is normally played by a child actor. In this style of performance, Mai Bayashi, only the demon protagonist appears on stage and performs without robes or mask. Oh, <laughs> 
On the no stage in his own home in Tokyo, Mr. Sakai rehearses the same scene from Benkei at Sea with his 10-year-old son Otoharu playing Yoshitsune. <laughs> ここ生まれる前から一応脳をやるように育てられまして初舞台が3歳の時で昔はあまりそのあまり勉強をしなくてても脳だけやってればよろしいというような考え方がそこの日本の独特の職人方に言ってますかね芸人方であったんですがまあ父が